Welcome to the latest Gramophone podcast. I'm Martin Cullingford, editor of Gramophone, and I'm delighted to be joined today by pianist Lara Downs. Lara, hello. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Now, we're here celebrating two dates. First, the centenary of the premiere of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, and also the release this month of a reimagining of that iconic work by my guest Lara. Now, before we get into exploring your wonderful new take on the piece, Let's reflect a little on the work itself. Few works are so beloved and few, but after 100 years, feel quite as contemporary as this still does. Can you place the original in the context of its time? What impact did it have? How radical was it? Well, I guess, you know, I think that what sounds new to us, you know how this piece, as you say, it's we hear it so many times and it sounds fresh every time. And every time I play it, it sounds fresh. And I think what that is, is the energy that went into the creation of it, which was taking all of these things that were so new and then making yet another new thing on top of them. You know, I love the, I love thinking about this time at the beginning of the 20th century in the States where so many people were moving around for the first time. And a city like New York City was full of just, you know, people who were encountering each other for the first time, finding new cultures, new voice, new languages, new sounds. And I think that's everything that was informing Gershwin's work on a piece that was meant to be an experiment. Remember, it was written for a concert called An Experiment in Modern Music. And he was just listening to the world around him and, you know, trying to create a, a, a new sound. That's fascinating. And and it was a great success, wasn't it? I think there were a million record sales from the first recording, 100 performances in the first year. Yeah, a huge success. And also, if you read about that concert, the concert wasn't very good. And it was very long. And people were getting really, and it was hot. It was hot in the hall. It was a winter day and it the heat, the heating system wasn't working. And so I'm imagining that horrible smell of like wet wool and wet fur and everybody getting cranky. right? And then as soon as this piece started, the energy shifted. And yeah, it was a huge success. Just the way it is today, you know, the same, I think it was the same response from that audience as it is when I play the piece today. Why do you think it has endured through the last century? Before we come on to, to talk about its life today in, in, in your hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, very good tunes for one thing. <laughs> and as I say, there's something just very authentic, heartfelt, excited, energetic about the music. I don't think you can lose that, you know, even when you hear the canned version of the piece that you hear on United Airlines, for example, or any number of other commercial uses, it still just has this appeal to it. Um, And then I just think that it lasts the same way that, you know, all of the, the great works that we still listen to in our world of classical music, the ones that are 200 years old and 300 years old, I think that they last because there's something in them of the heart and the soul and the um, experience of the composer. And somehow through the vibrations, we pick that up. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. And and it does still sound so incredibly contemporary. If you think of other works at that period of of time. And of course, there were works like, you know, by people like Verez, which were also very contemporary, but there's also works like the end of the Romantic period in, in mm-hmm. El- Elgar, for example. But I, I guess the point you made about it tapping into what was new and different and changing at that point of time, it was almost at the mm-hmm. beginning of, 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 of cultural musical trends. Yeah, I think it was. I think it really was a turning point. And there is a lot of music, as you say, from the early, you know, from the 19 teens and the early 20s, it does sound dated. And that's because everything changed so quickly. And, you know, all of a sudden, those rhythms and that energy of jazz started informing so many things. And, you know, we never looked back. Yeah. And perhaps that is part of it as well, being linked and rooted in in something like jazz, which is Another genre, though there are plenty of, of, of wonderful meeting points between that and and classical and and, and pop and rock. That, that I guess it doesn't feel like it belongs to any one thing. It it actually belongs to mm-hmm. everybody. Yeah, I ho- I hope so, and that's really been the focus of this new version.
So here we are. It's 2024 and you've commissioned a new version from the Puerto Rican composer Edmar Colon. And it's full of surprises, which listeners will love discovering for themselves. But tell me a little bit about how your reimagining came about and, and why. I think sometimes we don't do anniversaries very well. I think I think sometimes it's an anniversary year and we play a piece of music over and over and over again until everyone's sick of it. And I knew I'd be playing the Rhapsody a lot this year and that everyone would. And that just pushed me to think about why I care about this piece, why I love it so much. And I realized that, as I said, it's the intention that I feel, Gershwin's intention. And he specifically described that in words. He he talks about his vision for the piece. And the piece for him was um, illustrating the what he called the musical kaleidoscope of America, which I think is such a beautiful phrase. And he talks about the melting pot. And I just started digging a little bit deeper into his experience. He's a first-generation American, and he's 24 years old, and his parents have come to this country, and so many people are arriving. In, I mean, New York City is changing every day. Every day there's something new to find. So I wanted to um, go back into his state of mind and his state of being. I think what I always experience in this piece is, is that he's trying out new languages, and especially when you're talking about the rhythms. He's clearly hearing things. He's hearing rhythms that are coming from jazz, from black music. He's hearing rhythms that are coming from Latin music, and he's trying to translate them into written notation and into you know music that can be played on the piano and by a jazz band. And I wanted to investigate that. And that's why I wanted to work with Edmar, because he's, he's Puerto Rican. He's so deeply versed in all of those traditions, and he really understands them back to the source, back to Africa. So it's a question of taking the Rhapsody really back to its origin, to its roots, and then also stretching it forward into the future. Because when I think about that musical kaleidoscope and that melting pot, it's a very different thing in 2024 than it was in 1924. The whole world has come to America in the meantime. So just imagining, you know, how would Gershwin process this reality today? Mm. People often talk about authenticity in, in, in music. And, and often that means using the instruments of the time, trying to replicate what it might have sounded like then. But to me, another approach to authenticity is to say, actually, what can we do that was authentic to what was being done 100 years ago? And perhaps the equivalent is exactly what you've done to say, well, that's what this is what Gershwin was doing. This was how it resonated with people then and there. And actually, therefore, to, to be truly authentic, we need to do the same thing now so that it resonates with people today in the same way it might have done. Is that, is that a sort of fair summary of what you've tried to achieve? I think that's beautifully put, yes. And and. This music that happens at the crossroads, you know, all the music that is expressing a blending of traditions, for some reason, it's very personal to me. I feel I feel that place. And it's an adventurous place. It's a courageous place. And maybe you don't always get it right, but what you're trying to do is listen and translate into your own voice, your own language. And I, I, I love that impulse. So that's that's what I really value at the heart of this work. And it takes us into America and all its diversity. But then we also step into the, the Middle East, in, into Europe, Asia, mm -hmm. South America, of, of course. I mean, wh where did all this come from? Did you start with the score as was and then things grew out of there? Or did you have a sense of where you wanted to, to take us and then found ways to integrate it into the original piece? Well, I think I'm fortunate because I play the solo piano version of Rhapsody in Blue quite a lot. I've, I've played it, you know, the Grofet orchestration with orchestras, of course, but I, I play that solo version. So that's kind of my starting point. That's where we, we went to the to Gershwin's original score. And um, I think there were ideas from the very beginning about expansions. I mean, primarily, again, with these rhythms. What was he trying to say here? What was he hearing that brought about this particular measure or this particular phrase. And that was so exciting. I always remember the very first day that Edmar and I got together, I flew out to Boston about a year ago, 
And we were just sitting in this room at the conservatory and there were some drums in there. So I was playing some of these passages and he just started drumming on top of them. And all of a sudden there were these layers and I heard it too. I was like, oh, now I get it. And what if, you know, we allow these layers to exist and then all of a sudden we're in a different world and we're actually in the world that inspired him in the first place. Yeah, so it sounds like it was a very uh, collaborative, um, creative compositional process. It wasn't that you commissioned him, off he went years later, he came back with a score and, and off you went. It wasn't like that. It was wonderful. I have, I have, I don't know how many emails and we kept getting little ideas and sending each other notes and doing, you know, the nerdy, researchy scholarship stuff, which was actually very informative. One of the things that really changed the outcome, I think, is that I wanted to understand the patterns of immigration and what's happened over the last 100 years. I had sort of a sketchy idea, but I really wanted to understand decade by decade who was coming from where and why. And once I started learning that, I learned some fairly terrible things about, well, for one thing, just the history of immigration in this country, and especially the year 1924, in which just a few months after Gershwin wrote this piece, there was new legislation passed that really shut down immigration, really shut down Ellis Island, and was specifically targeting people who came, for example, from the part of the world that Gershwin's parents came from. So, you know, then I realized, well, he's he's writing this piece, this celebration of the melting pot in an environment where that melting pot is being threatened, which for one thing re resonates very much today in this country, but also gave me a perspective about, you know, maybe he's not just writing cute little tunes. Maybe he's also really expressing something that's deeply personal and passionate and endangered. Why did you particularly approach uh, Edmar Colin to do this? You could have looked for different traditions, different composers. Why, why did you settle on, on him? He's done an amazing job, but, but what, where, tell me where that collaboration actually came from. We had met a couple of years ago in Boston at the Boston Pops. Um, we were doing a concert with them that focused on the music of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. And the concert opened with an arrangement that Edmar had done of Ellington's Caravan one of his classic songs, but he co-wrote that song with a Puerto Rican musician named Juan Tizol. And so Edmar had gone back to those roots. And it was just such a fascinating expansion and um, embrace of, you know, the origin story of that song. And I mean, I, the two ideas came into my mind at the same, at the same moment. I want to reimagine this piece and I want to do it with Edmar. Um, I, it, it wasn't a question of just like finding someone to arrange the piece. It was this shared impulse because I think that's an impulse that I always have. I'm, I'm passionately curious about the history of things, but not, not with the goal of, um, you know, confining them to the past. I feel like I want to understand the history so that I understand the present. And that's what we've done together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think it's it's really interesting to, to you to talk about immigration and the challenge it's faced and perhaps the importance, therefore, of, of bringing it into a work like this and reflecting those decades. And this is a wonderful example of, of saying something important, doing something important, but also as important as it is, it's also celebratory and and actually fun as well, which is which is a wonderful thing to yeah. to bring those things together and perhaps lift us all up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've come to some sort of peace or understanding about what you can do as a musician. You know, I, my parents were passionately dedicated to social justice and change. That's how I was raised. And sometimes I feel like, well, no, sometimes I have felt that maybe being a musician is not the most impactful thing one can do. But I've changed my mind because I think that there is this role for music and art and, and beauty, especially in the most difficult times. And what you do is you make something that's joyful, that reminds everyone, you know, of the better, the best, the better that we can be. And yes, you can go to protest marches too. But I think to create something 
like what Gershwin made and hopefully what we're doing now and to just infuse the world with a, get something good that will last. That's probably a very valuable thing. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and, of, and of all art forms, music is capable of mm-hmm. crossing boundaries, well, actually, not so much crossing boundaries as, as bringing people together across those, those, those boundaries. Oh, exactly. You know, there was this really beautiful moment in our rehearsals. Um, so we had this orchestra that was made up of young players. It was a conservatory orchestra. We have me <laughs> you know, handling all these things at the piano. And then we had a tradi- an, an ensemble of traditional Chinese instruments. And we had these percussionists who are playing drums from West Africa and from the Caribbean. And um, we had not that much time to rehearse. And there were some moments that got kind of gnarly. And I remember Edmar stepped into the middle of the stage and he said, stop what you're doing. Stop thinking that that guy over there is playing some rhythm that you don't understand. Find the center of that rhythm and you'll be okay. And it was just this message about languages and, you know, the variations of language. And as musicians, we do get a little bit boxed into what we know. But to allow yourself just to stretch, I mean, it had implications far beyond that moment in this piece of music. It was really, for me, you know, a metaphor for how we can walk in the world and how we can um, listen and communicate. But everything shifted when he said that. The fear went away and we just started finding those centers and locking into those centers. You mentioned the Young Musicians, so it's recorded with the musicians of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music Orchestra. Uh, San Francisco, a truly international city, particularly in the wake of the the, the huge, extraordinary growth of the, the tech industry. So it, it feels like a great place to do a work like like this. Obviously, origins are rooted in perhaps New York sounds, but but here is is, is this extraordinary city. Um, talk a little bit about the the makeup of the musicians you you worked with in terms of their paths to come to the conservatory and perhaps what they they learned from it, but also contributed to the whole process. Mm-hmm. Well, um, for one thing, that's where I started my musical journey. I studied at that school when I was really little. So there's some sentiment there. Um, and then I guess, you know, one of the things that's changed really a, a lot maybe the most in this country, is the expansion of um, culture and life on the West Coast since Gershwin's time. But what sort of kicked this off is that I had been at the conservatory one evening last spring with a friend who's a jazz musician, and we just sort of dropped in on some of the students and surprised them, and we had this conversation about the crossroads, about the places where American music comes together. And it was so, it was such a wonderful conversation. I think that for me and for everyone of my cohort and my generation, you know, we've we've come up in an environment where we have sort of had to fight for that, fight for the breaking down of boundaries and the deconstruction of genre and all of that. And these young musicians are free and clear of all of those assumptions or constraints. So I thought, how great to bring this new piece to life with a group of musicians who are just diving in, you know, without trepidation or prejudice. And in fact, that's really how it felt. Um, they were so excited. And and I think there was also a lot of emotion just because of this attempt to reflect different experiences and different voices. Um, another memory I have from the rehearsals, we had this small ensemble of musicians who are playing traditional Chinese instruments. And that's because in San Francisco, the story of Chinese immigration is so vital to the region. As the piece moves around to different cities, that will also shift. I want to just reflect local traditions everywhere we go. But we had these musicians and they were kind of all the way downstage. And right behind them, just by chance, was the violin section, which had quite a few Asian American musicians in the section. And they started playing those instruments and where they play, it's where the slow theme starts. And it's totally transformed into this very otherworldly sound that's also just right. But the the expression on the faces of these young players, you know, to to be hearing and feeling their own lineage reflected within the environment of this symphony orchestra was really was really beautiful. Yeah, no, it sounds 
sounds really moving. So I didn't know that you're going to be touring with it and then drawing on different ensembles to or, or musicians to be part of the, the performance where where you are, as it were. Yeah, because that's another thing about American music. You can't. I mean, it's a, it's not one thing. It's a lot of different things. It's a really big country. So I think that's an interesting presence too. And just going back to the piece it, itself, as you say, it's a piece we all know well. We think we know well. You described it coming out of the tannoy in an aeroplane as you bought. And actually, mm-hmm. just as a listener, to to have that familiarity shaken up and to hear a work mm-hmm. new and different and and fresh and and as if I were there at the time, being surprised by it is is a wonderful, rewarding thing. Yeah, I. And you know, when you do something like this, well, you're invested, you believe in it, you never know what other people are going to think. Um, it was that that first performance was was really um, very gratifying and moving in that way, because I think we should never let anything get set in stone or sacred. You know, we should always be reconsidering everything as it moves along with us through time. And it was really beautiful to experience the audience's reaction to that, you know, to, sure, to grab onto the things you know, but then also to let yourself experience this whole new lens on that. Um, It kind of reminded me, you know, when you see those old photos that have been colorized, right? So you'll see a street scene from, you know, the turn of the 20th century, but then you see it in color and then you realize, oh yes, the world was in color back then. (laughs) Yes, which should be such an yeah. obvious point. But you're ab- absolutely right. And at the very beginning of the conversation, you talked about what can we do interestingly with anniversaries, and and again, that that's such a brilliant thought because often anniversaries is it's a date and a calendar. So let's tell people a story they already know. But actually, using anniversaries to to change the way we think about something is is a really valuable opportunity. I think. I hope so. Lara Downs, it's been a real pleasure. Rhapsody in Blue Reimagined is available on the Pentatone label. Lara, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for this great conversation. And that recording is available digitally for streaming or high-resolution download. Thank you for listening to this Gramophone podcast. If you've enjoyed it, there are many more episodes to find and to enjoy. Simply look up Gramophone magazine wherever you get your podcasts. And if you really like what you hear, then please do consider leaving a rating or a review. It really helps other people to find our work. Gramophone magazine is available on the newsstand or digitally. And if you'd like to subscribe, then all listeners to this podcast can get a 20% discount off any package. Simply visit gramophone.co.uk forward slash subscribe and enter the code podcast20 at the checkout. Thank you for listening and do join us again for another Gramophone podcast next week. (laughs) 